Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about some rumors on production at Giga Texas. Some hard to believe numbers here that we'll talk about. We've also got some new data out of China, updates from Uber and Hertz on integrating Tesla into their fleet. Got an upgraded initial quality study from JD Power. Tesla's made a bit of an improvement there, and a few other items as well. All right, quick look at the markets. Contrary to a somewhat prevalent opinion, it turns out Tesla stock can actually underperform if Elon Musk isn't tweeting. Tesla today down 1.8%, though recovering a little bit in the afternoon to finish at $685.47 while the NASDAQ was basically flat. Some people attributing that to the layoff of data labelers that we had talked about yesterday. Personally, I think it's just a little bit of rotation. If you look at some other relevant stocks like lithium, some of the Chinese EV makers down around the same. So probably nothing really Tesla specific, but people always inclined to look for reasons. Quick macroeconomic update, like we had talked about earlier this week, the US GDP for the first quarter was finalized today. It was adjusted down from the preliminary estimate by one tenth of a percent. So the final number for Q1 GDP is down 1.6%, and we'll get the first preliminary release for Q2 in late July. Quick reminder before we get into some of the other news, if you are interested in attending Tesla shareholder meeting on August 4th in Texas, Tesla is holding a drawing for in-person attendance for any shareholders. If you are interested in that, the window to enter that drawing closes on July 1st, so just a couple days left to enter. I'll put the link to do that down in the description. All right, I want to start off today with a report from Electrek. This is definitely in the rumor category, but we have been talking about how Giga Texas seems like it might be at a bit of an inflection point with the ramp of the 2170 Long Range Model Y at that factory. Electrek today reporting that, quote, Tesla has managed to ramp up production at Gigafactory Texas to thousands of units per week, adding production of the Model Y long range on top of the standard range version. End quote. Electric says that they have obtained inside information for the first time that gives them a better idea of Tesla's production rate at the new factory. They say, quote, one source said that Tesla is making as many as 5,000 vehicles available to deliver per week from Gigafactory Texas, but it's not clear if that's a sustainable rate. Another source said that Tesla is capable of producing at least 2,000 Model Ys per week at the plant since adding the Model Y long range to the mix, end quote. All right, well, if Tesla is actually anywhere close to kind of either of those numbers, that would definitely be quite the inflection point for Giga Texas. For context, I have production from Giga Texas for the second quarter being below 5,000 units for the entire quarter. Even just a couple thousand here at the end of the quarter would probably put them ahead of what I've been forecasting and would probably put Tesla on track to beat my forecast for Q3 as well. So obviously at this point, we have to take this with a grain of salt, but it is worth not just completely writing off because we should be expecting some sort of inflection like we've already been talking about this prior to this information. Even yesterday, we talked about how there's been a lot more activity at Giga Texas. So I think it's worth looking at these two rumors in combination. They say they have one source saying Tesla is making as many as 5,000 vehicles per week, and then another source saying that they're capable of producing at least 2,000 per week. Those two may not be in quite as much conflict as they might seem at first, Maybe that 5,000 vehicle rate is talking about their peak daily production rate extrapolated over an entire week. Maybe Tesla can't do that right now, but maybe over the entirety of a week, they're doing at least a couple thousand. Something like that fits with both statements and then starts to fall back into the realm of plausibility. Now, kind of on the other side of that argument, we've got Joe Tagmeyer here today on Twitter. He does drone flyovers of Giga Texas saying that production has reached 100 plus cars per day. That would be quite a bit lower than the numbers Electrek is talking about here, probably a little bit below 1,000 per week. One possibility I could see that would still fit with all of this, I'm not saying this is what I think is most likely, but one possibility could be that Joe might be talking about 4680 vehicle production and Electrek talking about total output, but I think everyone's kind of in the same boat of trying to piecemeal together a lot of these different rumors. The good thing is that as we get more data, obviously the Q2 delivery and production report here on Saturday most likely, and then as we start to see more deliveries happening over the next couple of weeks, we'll get more VIN data. And those things should work to fill in a lot of the missing context that we've got right now. So again, grain of salt for now, but the rumors here are definitely exciting, especially when paired with the rumors that we've got on Giga Berlin and their shift expansions. We might all of a sudden here as we move into Q3, be looking at Giga Texas and Giga Berlin in combination, doing somewhere close to around 4,000 vehicles per week and hopefully continuing to ramp from there. Even without a further ramp, that could mean 50,000 vehicles from those two factories in Q3, and that would give Tesla a pretty good shot at hitting 400,000 for the quarter. And again, that would be with the downtime for the Shanghai upgrade. So again, probably our next clue on this will come on Saturday when we do get the Q2 production numbers. Planning on going through my detailed forecast for that tomorrow, so we have the context going into it. And by the way, last night Tesla sent out the company compilation of analyst estimates. Consensus for Q2 deliveries from the 25 analysts surveyed was about 267,000 vehicles, but five had not updated their estimate since the China lockdowns. 
So Tesla showed that consensus with both 25 analysts and then also excluding those five, so just 20, and the 20 that had updated their estimates since those lockdowns, the consensus was 256,700. So that's much more in the ballpark of what we've been talking about. Of course, when we do actually get the final numbers, generally the media is not going to be giving quite as much context. They'll just talk about the total consensus from FactSet or wherever else. All right, moving on, but somewhat related here, we've got new information out of China. We've got the most recent update for insured units in China. So we've talked about these on a couple of occasions, but from June 20th to June 26th, there were 18,186 Teslas insured in China, so about 2,600 per day. That puts the total over the last four weeks at 64,200, but remember that does include two days of May. If Tesla is able to maintain that same rate or maybe even increase it over the last few days of June, we could be looking at another 10,000, 11,000 or so, then take one or 2,000 off from those last two days in May, and we could be looking at 73,000 or so in insured units for June in China. So in general, this is good news. It's the best insight that we have that Tesla is on track with that 71,000 vehicles produced in June rumor that we had heard in terms of being Tesla's target. But remember, there can be somewhat sizable discrepancies between what production ends up being, what sales end up being, and what insured units end up being, because they're all a little bit different, especially production from the other two. Still though, the most important thing, it does support that Tesla is having a strong month of production here in June from Shanghai. All right, next we've got a couple of updates here on the integration of Tesla vehicles into fleets from Hertz and Uber and Hertz then working together, basically facilitating the rental of Tesla vehicles for Uber drivers on a week-to-week -week basis. So Uber provided an update on this yesterday. They said that, quote, to date, more than 15,000 drivers have rented a Tesla through this program, and they're making a real impact. Together, they've completed more than 5 million fully electric trips and driven over 40 million electric miles, end quote. I'd love to do some meaningful math off of that. Unfortunately, we don't have quite enough information there. 40 million electric miles over 15,000 drivers is only 2,600 miles per driver, but that doesn't tell us anything about the number of miles per car because if someone rents it for a week and then returns it, that car is going to get more miles on it divided over more drivers. The reason I wish we had more information on that is because it's interesting to see Teslas being used in these fleet type of ways because this means that one Tesla, if it is putting on additional miles from what an individual consumer might put on, would be having an outsized impact on emissions reductions. So this is kind of a win for everybody. I mean, the companies that are renting these vehicles, their drivers seem to be relatively happy with these programs. We'll talk more about that in a second. Tesla gets more demand for their vehicles. That helps them maintain prices and margins. Customers, of course, get to ride in EVs versus some of the other vehicles that are then no longer being used in the service. And there's potential for a significantly outsized emissions reduction. So it's really cool to see this. And then in terms of the actual Uber drivers themselves, obviously it's gonna kind of vary case by case on whether or not it makes sense. But especially with rising gas prices, the use case becomes that much more quickly compelling. Bloomberg just did a story on this and they highlighted one driver who has been renting a Tesla at a rate of $344 per week. This driver switched over to that from driving a 2009 Camry. And Bloomberg notes that even after accounting for the cost to charge the car, she was paying about $450 per week to drive the quote-unquote car of her dreams, less than the almost $600 required just to fuel that 2009 Camry. So that doesn't account for any depreciation or maintenance or anything beyond that for the Camry, and she is still coming out significantly ahead. They say that in total during her 25-day rental, she netted more than $2,600, more than double the $800 to $1,000 she typically would have made in that time period from driving the Camry. So this completely makes sense. The more miles you're putting on a vehicle, so if you're doing any ride sharing, any professional driving, long commutes, whatever the use case, the total cost of ownership curve changes extremely rapidly in the favor of electric vehicles for those use cases. Throw a couple dollars extra per gallon on gasoline on top, and it's really just a no-brainer, especially when the company like Hertz or Uber is taking on the risk of ownership and you can just rent. Yeah, there's less upside in that scenario, but it's going to be a lot more accessible in this use case. So it's very interesting to see people kind of slowly figuring this out, building little business models around it, and Tesla is right at the heart of those things, reaping a good share of the reward. All right, next up today, we've got an update from JD Power. They have released their 2022 US initial quality study. This is probably one of the most widely referenced studies from them. And there are quite a few interesting details in this year's study. It's particularly interesting because of what's been happening over the last year. JD Power says that problems per 100 vehicles has increased 11% from 2021. They're attributing that to all the difficulties with supply chain, starting and stopping of manufacturing, I'm sure, personnel dislocations. JD Power saying those things have added up and have increased the initial quality problems. 
As for Tesla specifically, we'll talk about their numbers, but I had to kind of chuckle at JD Power's description here. They say that, quote, Tesla Motors is included in the industry calculation for the first time with a score of 226 problems per 100 vehicles. However, because Tesla Motors does not allow JD Power access to owner information in the states where that permission is required by law, Tesla vehicles remain ineligible for awards, end quote. So we've talked about this before with JD Power, but they've painted the picture pretty clearly themselves here. JD Power demands owner information from these automakers to have them be eligible for these JD Power awards, and all of these other automakers, except for Tesla, just hand it over. That's basically extortion that happens to be legal. Now, of course, JD Power just justifies that by saying, oh, they don't have enough data because they can't get the data from the owners in those states. But it seems like they've kind of just self-defeated that argument by now including Tesla in the industry average. So anyway, good for Tesla for sticking up for owner privacy. But anyway, looking at Tesla's score, 226 problems per 100 vehicles, that is 25% more than the industry average of 180. Of course, just like we have talked about with the Consumer Reports reliability studies, not all problems are created equally. All of these things seem to do a very poor job of accounting for that, even though it is critically important. But setting that aside, even though the average did go down by 11% across the industry this year, Tesla did improve their score from 231 problems per 100 vehicles last year, so about 2%. So that's good to see, and this number, it's not like it's a huge outlier or anything like that. It's actually slightly above Volkswagen at 230. The other thing to note is that internal combustion engine vehicles, probably because they have been being manufactured for so long, tend to have fewer initial quality problems. The average there is 175 versus for plug-in hybrid EVs, that's at 239, and the average for pure EVs excluding Tesla is 240. So Tesla faring better than other EVs, even though the argument is often made that, oh, these other manufacturers are going to do so much better with EVs because of all their manufacturing experience. Well, not the case so far. All right, last couple of things for today. We've got some updates from Monroe and Associates. Looks like Sandy is over in Italy taking a look at the 9,000 ton Gigapress from Idra. So it looks like they'll have some content about that pretty soon. And they have also just acquired a 4680 Model Y from Texas. So they'll begin that teardown soon as well. Very much looking forward to that. Next, we have previously talked about how the European Union was looking to potentially ban internal combustion engine vehicles beginning in 2035. We've got news on that today covered here by the Economic Times that EU ministers have agreed on terms for a deal. It doesn't sound like this is truly the final last step, but the possible ban continues to move forward. There was a request here from countries including Germany and Italy, according to reporting here from France24.com, to, quote, consider a future green light for the use of alternative technologies such as synthetic fuels or plug-in hybrids, end quote. So that seems like it might be leaving a potential backdoor open for some kind of shenanigans, something to watch out for. But the EU Commission vice president in charge of the European Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, said that, quote, At the moment, e-fuels do not seem a realistic solution, but if manufacturers can prove otherwise in the future, we will be open, end quote. That, of course, seems reasonable, just a matter of how that ends up looking in reality. Lastly, then, Hyundai has released the design for the upcoming all-electric Ionic 6. We don't talk quite as much about Hyundai, but Hyundai Kia definitely worth keeping an eye on in the EV space. But the Ionic 6, definitely an interesting looking vehicle. I can't decide if I like it or not necessarily. It kind of looks like an inflated Porsche 911. I think I'm leaning towards liking it, but probably one that you would need to see in person to know for sure. But Hyundai does say that it has a drag coefficient of 0.21, so very efficient from an aerodynamics perspective. Let me know in the comments what you think of the Ionic 6, and that will wrap it up for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and we'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, June 30th, last day of Q2 episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.